Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this month's uh, Tea Time webinar. And it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Alice Bedia, who's going to talk us through endosomal escape of lipid nanoparticles with novel insights using refractivity techniques. So your PI team here in Europe um, consists of myself uh, and doctors Martin Rabel and Sarah Gherkin for answering all kind of scientific and technical questions across the region. And then for everything uh, commercial uh, related, we have uh, Jürgen Schmidt Schotig in uh, EMEA South and Suha Zwayen in EMEA North. So please feel free to reach out to us for anything precision and assistance related. With that said, um, I'll hand it over to you, Alice. Thank you, Edward, for the kind introduction. It's really my pleasure to talk to you today about my project on endosomal escape of lipid nanoparticles. The data that you will see today, they were recently published on applied material and interfaces, and they are the results of a productive collaboration uh, between the University of Manchester and, uh, and AstraZeneca. And these are the main people involved in the project. So Professor Jane Lawrence and Richard Campbell from the University of Manchester and uh, Maria Nashford and Mark Jackman from AstraZeneca. And today I would like to start uh, just with a brief introduction, <clears throat> a bit of background. So gene therapy holds great potential in the cure of many diseases, uh, either through gene expression, for example, via the uh, delivery of mRNA, or gene knockdown, for example, via the delivery of uh, sRNA. However, there are some limitations associated with the delivery of uh, nucleic acid, in particular RNA, including the stability of these molecules in biological fluids, the lack of specific cell targetability, and the poor permeability of plasma membrane. For this reason, it's practically impossible to uh, administer pure uh, nucleic acid, uh, nucleic acid on, on their own, but um, they need to be protected and transported by a carrier. A carrier that needs to be taken up by the cell, but not only, it needs to escape the endolysosomal system in order not to be destroyed uh, to, mm, to not to be destroyed in the lysosomes. In fact, uh, in particular for RNA therapy, the RNA needs to be released into the cytosol to, uh, to do its job. Lipid nanoparticles represent one of the most successful carriers developed for RNA delivery, uh, in particular after the development and the release in the market of the mRNA-based uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And for this work, we used uh, the reported formulation as a model. We have as a main component, the ionizable lipid MC3, which was reported to be located mainly at the core of the particle and to be the responsible of the interactions with the, with the nucleic acid. Then we have uh, other two structural or helper lipids, DSPC and cholesterol. And finally, we have a pegylated lipid. In our case, we use dmg PEG, which is mainly located at the surface of the particle. So really, this nanosystem uh, have all the main characteristics that um, and the properties that are an ideal carrier for RNA ne needs to have, including uh, protecting the nucleic acid particle from nucleases past the plasma membrane and ensure its release into the cytoplasm. And it's really on this last point that our research uh, focuses on. This, uh, because this step of the endocytic pathway, which is called endosomal escape, is really crucial. And it's crucial, especially if we think that it was previously reported that less than 2% of uh, the administered sRNA was able to escape the, the endosomes and be released into the cytosol. So this is telling us that there is great room of improvement in this particular step. Um, if we could only understand more and deeply this process, we would be able to uh, design and produce um, more efficient delivery systems. 
There is a proposed mechanism of endosomal escape of these uh, lipid nanoparticles that was um, proposed by Callis and co-workers. Essentially, the ionizable lipid, uh, in our case, as I said, is MC3, for example, as a pKa of 6.4. That means that when in um, acidic conditions, like for example, into the endocytic environment, it becomes positively charged and it starts interacting with the negatively charged lipids in the inner side of the endosomal membrane, switching from a cylindrical uh, shape structure to a conical uh, shape structure ultimately disrupting the endosomal membrane, the bilayer. However, these uh, um, uh, processes are very hard to see uh, in real life, but even in artificial system. Therefore, our scientific question here was, can we use reflectivity technique to get new and novel insights into the physical chemical processes occurring between LNPs uh, and the endosomes? And in order to investigate that, we use Langwey monolayers as um, endosomal models, very simplified endosomal models. Um, in particular, you will see today um, an early endosome model, which is essentially a lipid mixture um, of POPC, DOP, sphingomyelin, and cholesterol. And obviously, as LMP's model, we used uh, the formulation that uh, I just showed one minute ago, prepared using an assembler microfluoridic device. And this is our experimental setup. We use a language trough, which is filled with an interface or buffer, which can have different pHs. And the lipid monolayer, so the early endosome model, was spread uh, at the air-water interface. And after that, the nanoparticles were injected into the interface directly using a syringe um, underneath the monolayer. And then the interactions uh, between the EM and the LNPs uh, uh, could be monitored over time. But what kind of techniques did we use to monitor the interaction? So let's start from the surface pressure. So to monitor surface pressure, we simply use a, a probe or a Wilhelmy plate that it's um, inserted into the air water interface. Um, if you look at this example graph at the bottom, you will see that at the beginning, the early endosomal model is stabilized at about 15 millinewtons per meters pressure. And at time zero, where the black arrow is, the nanoparticles are injected. After this moment, the changes in surface pressure were monitored over time. Like for example, in this case, you can see an increase in surface pressure, and this is related to an increase in density of the lipid chains in the monolayer, or for example, lipid packing. But let's now have a look at the real data that we collected. You can see here in this graph, um, a series of, of curves that we recorded at different pHs, starting from pH 5.5, uh, up to pH 8.5. And what is immediately evident is that there is a big difference in terms of surface pressure at plateau between curves recorded at acidic pHs, so pH 5.5 and 6.5, and curves recorded at higher pHs. Um, as I said before, this has to do with increase in uh, lipid packing at their water interface. So, Basically, components from the lipid nanoparticles are translocating uh, to the surface or they are interacting uh, with the lipid monolayer at acidic pH. But this is also telling us another thing, and that is MC3 is probably the main responsible of this interaction since it is the only um, the, the main component of our system that is so sensitive uh, to this uh, pH um, range. Then um, the second technique that we use is Brewster angle microscopy or BAM. 
BAM is an imaging technique and it gives information on the lateral characteristics of the films. Uh, with this technique, if uh, the air water interface, there are regions of pure water, the light uh, is not reflected uh, or only minimally reflected. So these regions will appear black at the, uh, at the, cam with the, at the camera. But if there are regions of uh, lipid domains or, or different phases, the light will be reflected and these regions will appear gray or brighter. The image here at the bottom is an example of an image of the EEM, so the early endosomal monolayer on its own, so before the nanoparticles injection. And as you can see, uh, some domains of few microns in size uh, are, are evident. Let's see uh, what we got um, when we wanted to capture an image after the nanoparticles injection at pH 5.5 at late time point. As you can see from the image here on the top, um, the situation is quite different from what we get with the early endosome on their own. In fact, uh, the domains are not visible anymore, but instead some very bright features uh, appeared uh, that formed an, a sort of network, probably indicating a change of phase uh, due to the lipid packing. On the other hand, when we took an image after nanoparticles injection at pH 7.4, uh, we could see that the domains are still present, but also some bigger domains appeared floating uh, at the surface. So I'm gonna leave you with that for one minute and I'm gonna move on to the other question that we asked. So we wanted to investigate the impact of the LNPs on their own. So repeating the experiments, but this time in absence of the early endosomal monolayer. And what we found, uh, it's interesting because um, at pH 5.5, uh, we still got a higher surface pressure values uh, a plateau compared to pH 7.4 and 8.5. And with BAM, again, uh, at pH 5.5, um, very bright features were observed, uh, again, showing a change of phase, but the same thing was not observed at pH 7.4, where again, big domains um, were, uh, were seen floating uh, at the surface. So essentially these results are really matching the ones with the EEM, indicating that the, um, the biggest impact to these results are, uh, are given by the nanoparticles themselves. But at this point, we had another scientific question. So what's the impact of the nucleic acid inside the nanoparticles on the results? And uh, so we repeated the experiments and the results were even more interesting because we found out that um, nucleic acid free nanoparticles at pH 5.5 reached lower surface pressure values compared to the ones obtained with RNA loaded nanoparticles. And also when we look at the BAM, uh, the bright features at pH 5.5 were not observed this time. But um, for what concerns the pH 7.4 and 8.5, the results are very similar, if not practically equal. So uh, with all these results, uh, we were allowed to draw some conclusions. And actually, we identified three processes, and this is our model. So when we inject lipid nanoparticles, uh, in an interface that has a pH um, equal or below 6.5, what happens is that the peg at the surface of the nanoparticles is desorbed. Um, MC3 becomes positively charged, and this is probably causing nanoparticles instability. What we did observe experimentally is an increase in surface pressure and bright features appeared with BAM only for RNA loaded nanoparticles. And this is because LN components from the LNPs are translocating to the surface or interacting with the endosomal monolayer. Therefore, 
we can really uh, identify two processes. The first one is applicable to RNA loaded LNPs, but also empty LNPs, which is just lipid components from the nanoparticles insertion into the monolayer or translocation to the surface. The second one is the formation of a, a nucleic acid and ionizable lipid complex and its translocation to the, um, uh, to the, to the monolayer and to the surface. Um, this is the reason why we did observe a difference between empty and RNA loaded nanoparticles, because the complex itself has a higher impact in the, in the surface pressure values and uh, in the imaging. On the other hand, uh, when nanoparticles are injected into an interface equal or above seven, uh, the PEG is still desorbed from the surface. Um, but in this case, the nanoparticles are more stable um, in these conditions. What we did, we did observe is a small increase in surface pressure and the presence of domains with BAM. So in this case, the phenomenon that we observed is nanoparticles binding uh, to the surface or that translocation uh, and interaction with the, with the monolayer. And this is true for RNA loaded and empty LNPs. And that's the main reason why we did not observe a difference at these pHs between the two formulations. So altogether, these results are, are telling us that reflectivity techniques can really uh, represent a robust complementary physical basis for future work. Um, future work that we're already looking into. Uh, in particular, we, we want to test alternatives to MC3 ionizable lipids, so testing different formulations to compare uh, their interactions with, uh, with the endosomal membranes and test it they, testing their endosomal escape capacities. Also, neutral reflectometry is um, a very useful technique uh, that we are looking into as we speak. Um, in this case, you can use deuterated components. Um, and you, thanks to the neutron beam, you can really get more quantitative information on uh, the lipid exchanged or incorporated into a monolayer and the localization as well of the molecule of interest. Obviously, all this is not to uh, replace in vitro studies. Uh, which are essential, uh, but we really believe that understanding the physical um, chemistry behind these processes is really important and we really aid in uh, for the future design uh, of improved delivery systems. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk for today. I would like to thank uh, my supervisors and collaborators from uh, the University of Manchester and AstraZeneca, the founders, um, the NAUCAD, which is the joint venture between the University of Manchester and AstraZeneca, and I've been working on for, for four years. Um, ultimately, I would like to thank Precision Nanosystem for inviting me today. It was really my pleasure, and thank you for listening. So I think I would like to thank you here. Thanks very much for your time and thanks very much for your excellent work. It was really interesting for us to hear from you. And there was many things to learn for me. We have many uh, questions that is unanswered, but don't worry everyone because we are going to follow up with you by email. So yeah, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much again. <laughs> thank you.